Amen. And uh, I don't know about you, but I miss our pastor and uh, look forward to having him back here in just a few days. And uh, what an awesome uh, testimony that we saw in the video and uh, just what the Lord is doing across the world as we think about SLC Asia. Well, let's take our Bibles here this evening. Let's stand together and uh, turn with me to Proverbs chapter number three, Proverbs chapter number three, and a very familiar passage as we think about verse number five and uh, verse number six. And I want to bring to you a message entitled here tonight, Trust in the Lord. And specifically, as we think about the guidance of God, the leadership and the direction that God wants to give us within our lives here tonight. Proverbs chapter number three and uh, verse number five and then also verse number six. The Bible reads in verse number five, it says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding in all thy ways acknowledge him and he, God, shall direct thy paths. If you have your Bibles open to that passage here this evening, let's read that together if we can in unison, starting with verse number five, ready, begin. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this evening. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for your many blessings that you bestow upon our lives. And Father, as we come together tonight, as we open up the Word of God, I pray, Lord, that you would take away all the distractions that we might have internally within our minds, the distractions that we might have externally. And then, Father, I pray that you'd help us to focus on the truths that we find here within these verses. Lord, I pray tonight, once again, that you would encourage us. I pray, Lord, once again tonight, that you would edify us. I pray, Lord, once again, that you'd remind us about this truth in trusting in the Lord. I pray, Father, that we would acknowledge you in all things and lead not to our own understandings. And then, Father, I pray that we would learn here tonight how we might be directed by the guidance of God. And so, Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts tonight. I pray, Lord, that you would encourage us, challenge us, convict us. And ultimately, Lord, I pray that you would receive glory and honor for everything that takes place here tonight. Father, we love you. Thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know, nobody in this life, as far as I know, enjoys the feeling of being lost or arriving at a location and realizing that it's the wrong destination. But that is exactly what happened to the passengers on a British Airways flight on March the 25th in 2019. They had departed from London, England. They were headed towards Dusseldorf, Germany, but instead they ended up landing 525 miles away from that destination in the city of Edinburgh, Scotland. Could you imagine that? You take off from London, you're expecting to land in a certain city, and all of a sudden, several hours later, you're not at your destination, but you're at a completely different country. What was supposed to be a one-hour flight became a six-hour detour, and the problem all began when the incorrect flight plan was filed by the flight dispatcher. And although it is rare here tonight to hear about an airplane getting lost or arriving at the wrong destination, the fact of the matter is here this evening that human navigation and plans are always susceptible to error. Uh, it doesn't matter here tonight how many checklists we have, it doesn't matter here tonight how many protocols that we might have in place. Nobody is perfect and no person is devoid of mistakes within this life. However, the Bible teaches us here tonight when it comes to God's navigation, uh, when it comes to God's direction, when it comes to God's leadership and instructions within our lives, the Bible teaches us that God is always perfect. Uh, God never gets lost. Uh, God never has to recalculate. God never guides us to the wrong destination, but God is always perfect in his leadership and in his direction within our lives. The Bible teaches in Psalm 18, verse number 30, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. For who is God save the Lord? Or who is a rock save our God? It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. And here tonight, the Bible teaches us that the perfect God 
of the scriptures, uh, the perfect God of the word of God, the omniscient one, the omnipotent one, the omnipresent one, the self-existent one who makes no mistakes, who has absolutely no error. Tonight, he desires to guide you, and tonight he desires to direct and lead our lives in his purpose in the way that we ought to go. The Bible teaches us in Psalm 32, verse number eight, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. And what a wonderful blessing that is. And uh, what a great promise that we find within the scriptures that the perfect God of heaven, he desires tonight to guide us. He is interested in your life. He is interested in my life. He desires to instruct us and to teach us and to direct us in the way that we ought to go here this evening. Young people, God wants to direct you to that perfect spouse in the future. College students, God wants to direct you to that ministry where you would serve him and turn the world upside down with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight, God wants to guide us in our careers and God wants to guide us in our marriage and God wants to guide us in the trials that we face within this life and God wants to guide us as we face the decisions concerning our finances and our future and our family and our faith. And thank God here tonight that we're not alone in this journey called life, but God Almighty desires to lead us and direct us and guide us in the way that he desires for us to go. And here this evening, as we think about Proverbs chapter number three, we find here several truths on how we might receive the guidance of God, uh, how we might receive the direction of God within our lives. And I wonder here this morning, do you need the guidance of God? I wonder here this morning, do you need his leadership? Do you need his direction in your life here tonight? I want to share with you an encouraging promise that God teaches us that he has his direction and his guidance available for you and available for me here tonight. And so this evening, as we look at these two verses in Proverbs chapter number three, I want you to notice with me several truths on how we can have the guidance of God as we navigate throughout this life. First of all, notice with me, I find here that we must depend on the Lord. We must depend on the Lord. And notice in verse number five, the Bible begins there. It says, trust in the Lord. And first of all, we find here tonight that we must trust in his character. We must trust in the character of our God. And you see, our trust and dependence upon God begins and it grows as we develop our relationship with the Lord. And the beginning of that trust begins with our relationship, which the Bible calls our salvation. It begins with accepting Jesus Christ as our personal Savior within our lives, for it's only through Jesus that one can be forgiven of their sins. You see, the forgiveness of sins is not through the baptismal pool. The forgiveness of sins here tonight is not through religiosity or works of philanthropy, but the Bible teaches us here tonight that the forgiveness of sins is through Jesus and through Jesus alone. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, the Bible teaches that he has saved us. And so we find here tonight that it's only through Jesus that one can be forgiven of their sins. It's only through Jesus that one can begin a relationship with the Father, a relationship with the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible teaches in verse number 12, it says that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. In John chapter one, verse number 12, the Bible teaches, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I think about just uh, yesterday morning, I think about a lady that I met out soul winning with my soul winning partner and her name was Betty. And uh, Betty was from Honduras and uh, her English wasn't very good. 
And uh, as we were speaking to her, eventually she allowed us to share the gospel with her. And, and uh, we went through the gospel presentation very carefully, making sure that she understood every single point that she is a sinner, uh, that every single person uh, is a sinner on this earth. And because of that sin, there's a condemnation of hell. But, but God loves you and Jesus Christ died for your sins. And it's only as you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone that you can be saved and begin a relationship with the Lord. It's not through the church. It's not through any good works that you do, but it's only through Jesus and Jesus alone. And I remember as we took about 30 minutes to present that truth to this lady by the name of Betty, at the end of all of that, I went through a review with Betty and I asked her, Betty, do you understand everything that we presented to you? And I remember Betty responded this way. She said, I understand everything. Uh, she said, my speaking English is not very good, but she said, my understanding of English is very good. I understand everything. And I asked Betty, do you understand that you're a sinner? She said, yes. Do you understand that because of that sin, there's a judgment? She said, yes. I asked, do you understand that it's only through Jesus alone that you can be saved? She said, yes. And I asked Betty, hey, would you like to bow your head and pray right now and receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And she said, yes. And at that moment, she bowed her head and she trusted Jesus as her personal Savior. And you see, at that very moment, by faith, Betty started a relationship with the Lord. And so it is, the Bible teaches us that at the moment one places their faith in Jesus and receives him as their Savior, that they begin a relationship of trust with the Lord. But then not only does it begin at the point of salvation, but then as we grow in faith, uh, as we grow in our understanding and in our knowledge of God's character, we develop in our trust and in our faith in God. As we grow in our knowledge of his love and goodness, as we grow in our knowledge of his mercy and his grace, as we grow in our knowledge of his holiness and perfection, as we grow in our knowledge and understanding of his character, it develops trust and it grows faith within our life as we develop a closer, intimate walk with the Savior. And you see here tonight, oftentimes, many Christians have a hard time trusting in God because we don't know him well enough. Uh, we might know some things about the Lord, but we don't know him intimately because we're not spending the time in the presence of our Savior and we haven't proven the Lord in our lives by faith. I think about the story of David and the Israelites versus Goliath and the Philistines that we find in 1 Samuel chapter number 17. We read about the Israelites, and the Israelites for sure knew about certain things of the Lord, but we find them in that context that they are filled with fear. Uh, their hearts are enveloped with fear as they stand before the enemy of the Philistines. But then we find young David, a man who knew the Lord intimately, and we find here that his response is completely different, that he's not filled with fear, but rather he is filled with a heart of faith. And the Bible teaches in 1 Samuel chapter 17, in verse number 34, it says, And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God." And as we think about the life and the testimony of David, he knew the Lord. Uh, he knew the Lord by experience. He said, as I was tending to the sheep, there came a bear and a lion, and God was faithful, and God fought on my behalf, and God delivered me from the paw of the lion and also of the bear. And God, once again, is going to deliver us from this giant by the name of Goliath. There was a trust that David had in the Lord as he developed his walk, as he grew in intimacy with his God. Many years ago, Adrian Rogers was once asked the question, why do we not trust the Lord? And to that question, he simply responded, one reason is that we don't know him well enough to trust him. To know God is to love God. Then to love him is to trust him to trust him is to obey him, and to obey him is to be blessed. 
You know, tonight we trust those that we have developed a close relationship with. If I was out tonight, maybe at a gas station and a total stranger came up to me and, and simply asked me the question, would you do something for me? My first response to that would be, what is it? What would you like me to do? And then if that individual responded back to me and said something along these lines, don't worry about what it is, just trust me, then my next response would be, see you later, all right? I'm not gonna trust you, I have no idea who you are. But if my wife came to me here tonight and she said, honey, could you do something for me? My response to that would be, what is it? And then if she responded, hey, don't worry about it, just trust me, my response to my wife would be, sure, I will do whatever you want me to do. Why? Because I know her. I know her character. I know that she loves me. I, I know that she would never do anything that would hurt me or embarrass me or cause me to sin before the Lord. I know her character, and therefore I can trust her. And it's a simple truth here this morning, but it's so important within our lives that as we develop in our relationship with the Lord, as we walk in the Word of God, as we spend time in prayer and communion with our Savior, that develops our trust and our faith in our God to trust in His character. Amen. And so first of all, we find here as we think about depending upon the Lord, we must trust in His character. But secondly, I want you to notice with me, not only must we trust in his character, but we find here in the latter portion of verse number five, we must trust in him completely. Uh, we must trust in him completely. And the Bible says there, with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. You know, oftentimes we cannot comprehend what God is doing in our lives. And oftentimes his commandments and precepts might not make sense in our own understanding. Nevertheless, we must not lean and depend upon our own logic and our own reasoning and rationale and thinking here tonight, but we must trust in the wisdom of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25, the Bible says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse number eight, the Bible says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, uh, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And sometimes there might come a point within our lives when maybe our hearts and minds lead us in a certain direction or a decision that is contradicting to the Word of God and contradicting to the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. And when that happens within our lives, let us be encouraged here tonight that we must not lean to our own understanding and it might not quite make sense exactly how the Lord is leading us. Nevertheless, we must remain trusting in the Lord. We must trust Him with all of our hearts and lean not to our our own understanding. I think about the character of Joseph that we find in the New Testament, probably one of the most neglected characters as we think about the Christmas story. But I want us to realize that he was a man who had complete trust in the Lord against his own understanding. When Mary was with child, Joseph would have immediately assumed concerning the fact that she was unfaithful for that was the only logical explanation. Uh, that would have been the only rational explanation concerning Mary being with child at that moment. The only explanation would be that she was unfaithful, that she had to be with another man. But the Bible teaches us in Matthew chapter number one, as the angel appears uh, unto Joseph, it says, but while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And then in verse number 24 in Matthew chapter number one, it says, then Joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife and knew, not, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. And you see, despite all of his own understanding, despite all of his own logic and rationale, he trusted in the words of God completely, and the Bible teaches that he took Mary to be his wife. And you see, sometimes in life, it doesn't quite make sense. Uh, sometimes as we walk the Christian life, it doesn't quite compute. 
uh, doesn't quite balance at the end of the day. Sometimes it, it leads us in, in, in ideas to have otherwise. And, and uh, sometimes it doesn't quite all make sense within our mind. Nevertheless, we must trust God anyways. You see, it didn't make sense to challenge the most powerful nation of his day and demand the release of God's people. Nevertheless, Moses trusted in God. It didn't make sense for a ruddy little boy to go up against a veteran soldier, a giant in stature. Nevertheless, David trusted in God. It didn't make sense to walk around a fortified city 13 times and then yell at the top of their lungs, but Joshua trusted in God. And it didn't make sense to dwindle down an army from 32,000 to just 300 to fight against the armies of the Midianites. Nevertheless, Gideon trusted in God. And it might not make sense to obey the commandments of God. It might not make sense to do what God is leading you to do. It might not make sense to give that amount to the offering. It might not compute and make sense to witness to that individual. It might not make sense to be faithful to all of the church services. It might not make sense to take that stand for that truth. It might not make sense to make that decision in following the Lord. But let me encourage you here tonight that we must trust God anyways and we must trust in Him with all of our our hearts and lead not to our own understanding. Somebody has said partial trust is not trust at all. Either God is trustworthy or he is not. If he cannot be trusted with all, he cannot be trusted at all. And so here tonight, first of all, as we think about trusting in the Lord, uh, as we think about receiving guidance from God, it begins with a dependence on the Lord. But then I want you to notice, secondly, as we continue, in verse number six, we find here not only must we depend on the Lord, but then secondly, we must defer to the Lord. We must defer to the Lord. It says in verse number six, in all thy ways acknowledge him. You see, this verse isn't simply speaking about recognizing the presence of God but here, as we think about these words of acknowledging him, it speaks about regarding and considering the Lord in all things. It is to manage all of our affairs as to please and to glorify the Lord by deferring to his desires, uh, by deferring to his will in every single aspect of our lives. And the spirit of deference here tonight speaks about a respectful submission and yielding to the judgment and the preference of the Lord in all things. You know, I think about sometimes when we have family uh, that come and they travel from out of state and we host them within our homes. And, and uh, I think about that time as we try to be a good host to them. We don't simply recognize their presence and simply say hi as they're on the couch and then go along with our business. But the entire time that they're there, we are constantly and carefully trying to defer to their desires and to their preferences. Uh, maybe their children enjoy animals and, and we might change our schedule to take them to the zoo. Uh, maybe they're interested in art and we might take them to maybe go see a museum. We're constantly deferring to them and their desires as we host them. We defer to them concerning maybe their entertainment. We defer to them concerning their preferences and maybe the meals that they desire to eat. Maybe they don't like seafood and so we're not going to go eat sushi. Maybe they like hamburgers and so we'll take them to in and out but we're constantly trying to defer to their their desires that we might please them as we host them. And in like manner here tonight, but so much greater, exponentially greater, when we acknowledge the Lord, it means to constantly seek to do that which is pleasing to the Lord, uh, to seek his will, uh, to seek his counsel and to seek his glory and to make him the Lord of our lives, not just in some areas and not just in certain things, but the Bible says, in all things, acknowledge the Lord. That means in the things that are important in life. Uh, that means the things that are urgent, also the things that might be mundane in the daily decisions that we make. Uh, during our work time, during our leisure time, the entertainment that we might view on our television screen, what we might scroll through on social media, when we grab a meal with friends and the financial decisions that we make in all things, we are to acknowledge the Lord. One commentator wrote, take one step at a time. Every step under divine warrant and direction, every plan for yourself in simple dependence on God. 
It is nothing less than self-idolatry to conceive that we can carry on even the ordinary matters of the day without his counsel. The Bible teaches us in Psalms 25, verse number four. It says, show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. And as David writes that psalm here, he says that he waited on the Lord all the day. It doesn't simply mean that he was sitting around, but what it's speaking about there as he's waiting for the instructions and the teachings and the guidance of God, it teaches us the truth here that he was constantly in communion with the Lord, seeking his direction, seeking his counsel, ready to obey however the Lord would lead. Lord, what do you want me to do with my finances? And Lord, what is your desire when it comes to my marriage? And Lord, how do you want me to raise my family here today? Lord, what do you want me to do when it comes to my workplace? And there's a constant waiting and a constant spirit of deference unto the Lord. You know, I think about the Paralympics here tonight and probably one of the most uh, amazing Paralympic events uh, the Paralympics, the Olympics for the physically challenged, one of the most amazing events or one of the most amazing competition is known as the Alpine Skiing Competition. And get this here tonight, it's the Alpine Skiing Competition for the blind and the visually impaired. Uh, these skiers ski with a sighted guide that rides in front of them a few yards ahead and they have Bluetooth earphones on and they follow the instructions given by their guide as they're going down the hillside at speeds of up to 70 miles per hour. Uh, I don't know about you, but to go down at 70 miles per hour on the side of a hill, I mean, with sight, that's scary, but here they are, those that are visually impaired following a sighted guide in front of them. Millie Knight, who's a champion in this sport, described the uncertainty that is involved in this event. She said, in a downhill, we potentially have jumps, and so when you're skiing along and suddenly the ground disappears from you, that can be quite scary. She went on to explain how important trust is between herself and her guide. And then she said these words. She said, I do not ski with my eyes. I ski with my ears. You see, she has no sight. Uh, she is unable to depend upon her sight and and her logic, she wholeheartedly relies on the instructions of her guide, and, and when he says turn, she turns. Uh, when he says roll, she rolls. When, when he says speed up, she speeds up. When he says slow down, she slows down. And for her to be successful on her run, she must completely trust and depend upon her guide, and then she must constantly defer to the instructions that she receives, constantly waiting constantly listening, what's the next move? Oh, where's the next turn and, and do I speed up here? Do I slow down here? She's constantly deferring to the instructions of her guide. And likewise for us here tonight, we must constantly defer to the words of the Lord in every single area of our lives and all things that we would acknowledge him. What is God's will when it comes to my family? Uh, what is God's will when it comes to my finances, when it comes to my job, when it comes to my future, when it comes to this trial, we must defer and acknowledge the Lord in all things. You know, in James chapter number four and verse number 13 down to verse number 17, uh, we find there a group of businessmen that are industrious. Uh, we find there a group of businessmen that are excited about the prospects of their future. And, and the Bible teaches us in James chapter 4, verse number 13. It says, Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. But then as we go down to verse number 17 in James chapter number 4, the Bible teaches us there, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And here James teaches that these men were being sinful. 
uh, these men were being foolish. Now, it's not teaching us here tonight in James chapter number four that, that it was foolish to plan. The Bible teaches us that we ought to plan. The Bible teaches us here tonight that we ought to be good stewards concerning our time and concerning our future. But the foolishness that we find here in James chapter number four is that they were planning their lives and they were saying, we're going to go into this city, we're going to sell and we're going to buy and we're going to get gain and we're going to have profit for a year. And they were planning their lives lives without the involvement of God. Uh, they were planning their lives without acknowledging the Lord. They were not deferring to God, and they never stopped to seek the Lord. They never paused to pray and seek the direction concerning God. And right in the middle of that passage in verse number 15, James gives us the answer of what their attitude should have been of what their spirit ought to have been. And it says there in verse number 15, for that he ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. And this is what we ought to say as well here tonight. As we think about our lives, that ought to be our spirit, that ought to be our heart tonight, that we would defer everything to the Lord that we would acknowledge the Lord in all things and, and it would be our spirit and our heart to say, if the Lord will, then we shall live and do this or that. Amen. Deferring unto the Lord, acknowledging him in all things in every single aspect of our lives. And so here tonight, as we think about the guidance of God, as we think about trusting in the Lord, the Bible teaches us, first of all, we must depend upon the Lord. Uh, we must trust in his character. We must trust him completely. And then we must defer to the Lord in every aspect, in every facet of our lives. And then finally, we find here then the promise at the end of verse number six. And that is the directions from the Lord. Once again, the Bible reads in these verses, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lead not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And you see, when we are depending on the Lord with all of our hearts, uh, when we're deferring to the Lord in all things, then God will begin to guide and direct our way, and he shall direct thy paths. The word direct here means to make straight uh, it means to make even. This word implies that, yes, God will lead and, and God will guide us within this life. But at the same time, it conveys the idea that God will also clear and God will also straighten the path that we take. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse number three, we find that word. Uh, once again, it says, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight. And that's the same word there, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places a plain. And you see, in the Old Testament times, roads were rough at best, but dangerous at worst, and travel was exhausting and oftentimes very dangerous and perilous. And, and when somebody like a king would take a journey, oftentimes he would send a group before him, and servants would go, and they would go through that pathway, and they would make his path smooth. Uh, they would make his path straight, if you let me say it that way, and they would remove the obstacles in the road. They would fill the holes, they would clear out the rocks, and they would make his path straight, and they would plan out the best route, and they would make the ground even, and they would make his path safe so that the king could travel over that route. And you see, that's what God is promising here in Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 6, to each and every single one of us, that he will guide us and that he will direct our lives and he will lead us in the right path and he will lead us in the way of satisfaction and he will lead us in the way of safety. And what a wonderful promise that is that we find here within the scriptures that God wants to direct our paths. And he wants to guide us within this life. In Psalms chapter number 23, the Bible teaches us in the first three verses, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And you see, God promises us here tonight 
that when we trust in him with all of our hearts, uh, when we trust in him completely, when we trust in his character, when we defer to him and we acknowledge him in all things, that God will direct our path and he will guide us. He will guide and lead us in our relationships here tonight. And maybe tonight you need the guidance of the Lord. Uh, maybe tonight you're going through some relational situations and tonight you desperately need the guidance and the leadership of God. God will guide you in your relationships. God will guide you in your career. Uh, maybe tonight you stand at the fork of a road. Uh, maybe tonight there are some important decisions that you need to make concerning your job or concerning your future. God desires to guide and lead us here tonight. God will guide us when it comes to our finances. He will guide us when it comes to our future and our family. He will guide and direct our paths here tonight. Psalm 37, verse number 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. And so tonight, as we think about these two verses in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, I wonder tonight, do you need the guidance of God? I wonder tonight, do you need the direction of God within your life? Are there certain areas within your life tonight that you desperately need God's leadership? You desperately need God to, to guide you and to direct your paths. The Bible promises here tonight that God wants to guide you. God wants to lead you and give you direction. But there are some conditions to that. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Depend upon God. Trust in his character. Trust in him completely. And then acknowledge him in all things. Defer unto the Lord. And as we live according to those truths, the Bible teaches that God will guide our steps. He will guide our path and he will guide the direction that we would take, that ultimately it would bring him glory and honor within this life. And so tonight, do you need some guidance this evening? God has direction for you. I encourage you here tonight, trust in him and defer unto the Lord.